spend millions of dollars every day to blow things up, then we can certainly spend $100,000 to replace a limb for one of our soldiers. Our focus, of course, is on the injured warfighter. That's a debt that can't be repaid. You want deep brain probes in the motor cortex? Do you want to go with the targeted re innovation of the residual limb and signals you get there? Do you want to do it with software, with sensors? What do you want to do? The whole point of prosthetics is to try and get us back to the everyday way of life. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. You know. By now, it's well known that more service members are surviving battlefield wounds in Iraq and Afghanistan than ever before. But now, more are returning home as amputees. And for those who have lost an arm or a hand, the core technology is useful, but it's dated. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is working to fix that. They've assembled a high-level team of neuroscientists and engineers from across the country to restore both life and limb. Here's where I can use a hand. Fred Downs is on a mission. He's chief prosthetics consultant at the Veterans Administration, and he has plenty to say about the medical technology available to service members and vets. Fred's an amputee himself. He lost his left arm to a landmine in Vietnam in 1968. Today, he's going to demonstrate a prototype version of a new prosthetic arm to amputees at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. I haven't been in bilateral for 40, 41 years, so it's like really neat. In my war, of the major amputations coming back, about 4% of them were upper extremity. That's all. Because the same blast that blew off your arm caused so much torsal damage it killed you. In this war, 23 to 24% of the amputations coming back are upper extremity because the body armor, the first aid on the battlefield, the quick evacuation, that they're surviving. And so there's a lot of attention to these upper extremities. Why don't we have a better product? Fred is wearing a better product for this visit. There's a special kind of a socket, squeezes me in, and they have air bladders in here, and they can adjust, or I can adjust the uh, tension in here. It's called the DECA arm. Since his injury, he's relied mostly on a traditional muscle-driven, body-powered prosthesis with a hook at the end. Now he's become one of the participants in the first field test of the new electronic arm. He's in the second week of the two-week take-home trial, and he's become an enthusiastic convert. The first thing I learned to use that grip for was to uh, drink beer. As soon as I got home, I said, i got to test this baby. But again, I've had that ability to reach up like this, which I never had with my body-powered arm. I can move this down a little bit. and put these together and there'll be a sensor here and here as they come together I get a vibration which tells me they're together. So it's a firm grip but it's designed not to be dangerous. I consider this my arm and my hand. I consider the body powered arm just as, as a good tool. Because what the engineers want me to do is and all of us to do who are wearing it is to put it to a test. Stay away from the chainsaw and the gun but do everything else that we can. I think the real significant discovery with Fred was, as he put in his words, I feel like a bilateral again, where he actually uh, was able to uh, connect with the arm on an emotional level. We conjectured that, we theorized that that might happen over some amount of time, but we hadn't expected it to happen in what amounted to about eight or nine days, and that was really the surprise for us. And his behavior changed in a manner that just allowed him to make use of the arm in a normal a manner as if it was his real arm. For support, one of the finest hospitals in the country, like Walter Reed or Harvard or Johns Hopkins, and you're going to get something that looks like a hook. And that's really not very functional when you think about the things we ask our hand to do. Play the piano, write, work a keyboard. You can't do that with a hook. We envision a prosthetic arm that will be controlled the same way you and I control our arms, with our thought, our intent. If we want to reach, we reach. If we want to grasp a cup, we grasp a cup. We don't think about opening and closing our hand. We think about grasping a cup. Colonel Jeffrey Ling is the man behind DARPA's revolutionizing prosthetics program, which is underwriting the DECA arm and other projects. Colonel Ling has contracted experts from around the country with all kinds of different skills. The goal? Find a way to restore amputees to as close to their former physical selves as possible and do it quickly. You're talking about brilliant engineers, 
But the beauty is marrying them up with the neuroscientists. That's how you move this thing forward. You don't have these people working in their own labs by themselves. You have them working as a team. That's the success. That's what DARPA does. One place DARPA went for expertise was DECA Research and Development in New Hampshire, a collection of 300 engineers, computer whizzes, toolmakers, skilled craftsmen. It's kind of a Willy Wonka chocolate factory for high technology. The load a design team can generate plans for a never-before-seen device, then deliver the plans to the in-house shop, where slabs of aluminum or titanium or other metal can soon be turned into pieces of a prototype. DECA has developed all sorts of important medical technology, but they're best known to the general public as the creators of the Segway. Compensates the length and diameter. Dean Kamen is the founder, mastermind, and resident inventor behind the company. They had heard that I uh, collect quirky, smart, unusual people that look at the same problems everybody else looks at, but see them a little differently. DECA is spread across two buildings of an old textile mill. The DARPA director and some of his managers came to visit. I was waiting for the big pile of data, and the big pile of, you know, the, the, the ever famous government specifications for toilet seats. But he just sits there and says, I don't want a plastic hook, a plastic tube with a hook. He says, I came here because you're going to give me something to put on these kids so that they could sit at this conference table, reach out, and pick up a raisin or a grape off this table. And he pretty much told us that we were insane, uh, which, is, which is good, because that's what DARPA does. We, we have to try to push the uh, boundaries of what is thought to be doable and not doable. Came and gathered a small team to travel around the country to research the feasibility of the new technology. And I said, I still think you're nuts, but not as nuts as I thought. And I think we could probably build an arm that is not as good as the original equipment, but way, way, way better than the garbage you're giving people now. Kamen estimated it would take about three to five years to have a prototype. DARPA told him he had two. It's not one of these things where the government said, OK, fine, here's the money, and we walk away and hope that they succeeded. No, no, we had a team of experts from the government representatives that met with them on a weekly basis, every single week. What are you doing? How far are you going? Push, push, push. And Dean Kamen and his team, to give them credit, they responded well. They're push, push, push. And the fruits of that is here. So what we did is we traded money for time. And then, of course, the wrist rotates. In fact, the wrist rotates more than yours can. He can go from one extreme <laughs> more than I can. All right, now we'll spin back. So it's a very, very uh, agile wrist. DECA calls it the Luke Project, after Luke Skywalker from the Star Wars series. In The Empire Strikes Back, Luke has his hand sliced off in a lightsaber fight with Darth Vader, which is later replaced with a good-as-new prosthetic arm. And into it have to go multiple microprocessors. DECA has produced a first and second generation version of its arm, all in less than two years. It's been incredibly exciting. You're seeing something go from a clean sheet of paper to an arm that people are wearing and then revising that arm, making it even better and, and seeing the feedback they get as we continue to improve it has been incredible. The arm has what designers call 13 degrees of freedom. This would be a degree of freedom. In fact, your finger has a couple degrees of freedom. And so you're able to move it in different ways. And so that's a degree of freedom. And side to side would be a degree of freedom as well. And so the same thing you see your shoulder, you have a couple degrees of freedom. Your elbow, you have a couple. and then humor rotation and then your wrist, you have a couple degrees of freedom.